So hel hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, here we are starting today with a talk uh, about uh, uh, photography. Maybe you remember the talk we've had uh, last year about photography and uh, law. Um, this year we're talking about uh, pho photography and how we can con uh, conserve photography. Uh, I'm from AXA Art. I'm the managing director of Switzerland and Germany, and I'm working together with uh, artists and uh, art collectors for more than 20 years. And we're discussing often the topic about photography and how to deal in the right way with photography. And uh, therefore, AXA Art invented two years ago a project uh, about uh, photography. And I'm introducing Bertrand Lavendrin to you. Bertrand is a director of a research uh, project in uh, Paris, he's the director of the Centre de Recherche sur la Conservation des Collections, and he's uh, not a restorer and not a c conservator, but he's a chemist, and uh, maybe you can introduce uh, us in your world and how you developed this institute, Bertrand. Well, thank you for welcoming me here. It's a great pleasure. Um, I started um, 30 years ago. Um, I did not create the institute. You know, I inherited from my former director. The institute is 50 years old, and uh, the main task of the institute is uh, carrying the collection. How do we preserve the collection? All kind of collection, museum collection, library and archives collection. What should we do for preserving? Uh, preventive conservation, for instance, but also how can we restore and how can we display hearts without damaging it? That's the main task of this institute, which is a national institute belonging to the Ministry of Culture and to the National Center for Scientific Research, CNRS, in France. So, and uh, but uh, I learned you are not working only in France, you are just coming over from Kuala Lumpur, going tomorrow to Spain for another co conference, and you're working in uh, worldwide projects uh, in the Middle East, in Russia, and in Asia, and uh, you're sharing your knowledge about uh, especially photography uh, conservation, and can you a little bit explain uh, what you're doing? Yeah, thank you. You are well informed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, we are, you know, it's a small community, and sharing the same interest. How can we use, display, and preserve better photographs? And there is, we, ha we have a few partners in North America, and there is a growing interest all over the world, in Europe, but also in Middle East. Uh, we are working in, in Russia, in St. Petersburg, with the Hermitage, with the Melon Project. So there are a lot of requests, a lot of questions, and we are trying uh, to gather people together to develop uh, or to increase the awareness and to develop the best standards for preservation of photographs in museum and archives and also in private collections. And uh, I think so, we see here in the Art Basel, <coughs> uh, the art world becomes more and more global and uh, the awareness uh, for photography and the preservation of photography becoming more and more interest. And uh, so what we're seeing since the last uh, 30 to 40 years, this market changed, but also the awareness changed. So 30 or 40 years ago, it was easy uh, to reprint something, and uh, now it changed to, re to more rest restore photography or to conserve the actual uh, status. How do you see this development? Yes, you, you are perfectly right. We, we are witnessing a, a huge change, a tremendous change in the field of photography uh, for the last 40 years. 40 years ago, uh, photographs didn't have the same value as they have today. And for anyone, uh, a copy was an equivalent of the original, and it was very common to see in, in the street. Uh, do restore your photographs, and the restoration of photograph was just a copy of it. And they were producing a new photograph and not paying attention to the original. Now it is no longer true. You know, the people have recognized the intrinsic value of, of the matter, of the constituent of the material of photographs. So matter, uh, photograph is an, uh, an, a 3D object. And we, we don't preserve only the image, but we also preserve uh, the body. We preserve the paper. We, and every, every part of a photograph is important historically. 
for authenticity, but also as a market value. I mean, the, the, the art market has, has changed, the value of, of photographs is, is very high now, so there is a lot of concern about preserving original, preserving the authenticity, and preserving also the, the trace of the passing time. You know, we are not doing any kind of restoration. We are, restoration of photographs is a, is a real serious job made by professionals paying attention to, to whatever they do, reversible treatment, and so on. And uh, so we're seeing a change in the, for example, restoration of uh, paintings, the philosophy, uh, how to deal with uh, paintings, restoration. So 30 years ago, uh, the restorer said, so I, I rebuild the status of the painting. And so we have, uh, in, uh, especially in the US, we see some Mark Roscoe's that are overpainted. 30 years ago, that was perfect restoration. And all the collectors say, wow, that's a real Mark Roscoe today. We are looking. From another side, we say though, this Mark Roscoe is not anymore in their origin original status. He's repainted. Is it the same uh, development in the photography restoration? Well, sure. We have the same trends. Uh, it's a general trend for art. We are paying more attention to the original object, and we try to preserve as long as possible the authenticity by preserving the matter itself. So in the past, some paintings or some photographs may have been over-restored. And now there is an ethic for conservation, and this ethic apply also to the field of photography. And uh, they are professional trained for photography, and they receive the same quality of training that those people working in the field of painting, furniture restoration. And it's really a, a, a long training. It's a five years training program, a master program. You can get in many cities, in many places in the world. But it's a very serious job. So. Uh, there is no difference in painting, in photography, in furniture. It's the same ethic. The approach might be slightly different depending on the, on the material. You know, you might have a different approach when you deal with video, when you deal with painting, when you deal with furniture and photograph. But the philosophy behind is the same. It's the philosophy of the restoration. And all, all what brought by a um, philosopher like uh, Cesare Brandi or Paul Filippo, that in the 1950s and 1960s, we're bringing new principles in the field of restoration, how to preserve an object without, um, without changing it, without changing the message. Because what is important in any art object is to transmit to further generation a kind of original message, the message that the artist was willing to transmit to the audience. So before we go more in detail, maybe you can explain the title of our lecture, Karm Volupti, but uh, looks limitation. Uh, you invented this title, maybe you well, can Well, you know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of a, of a joke because it's come from a French poem, Tout ici n'est luxe calme et volupté. Well, the idea was um, to say, to appreciate our art, you may have a specific condition of uh, a good environment and uh, but also you may to be careful you have to be careful that you don't put too much uh, too much light and you know light in uh, physical terms we measure it with lux so i was using the lux in uh, in the in the two meanings and uh, but for me what is very important that when you exhibit art and photographs are very sensitive to light. You have to be careful that you don't put too much lux on it, too much light on it, because you can damage it in a very short time. So that was the idea. You, you, you have to appreciate art in a very specific environment, but you have to limit the number of lux, the, the, the quantity of light you put on your object. Yeah, that's about our, our project, about this lux uh, limitation of an art object, especially for photography. Can you maybe explain a little bit about uh, what, what happens to a photography when there's too much light on it? And uh, so what happens after that? Yeah. Well, l light is a very powerful uh, agent. It's a very powerful parameter. We need light because without light, we cannot enjoy uh, uh, art. Well, at least uh, painting photographs. And uh, the problem is, if you put too much light, uh, you deteriorate materials. And color photographs are very sensitive to, to light. But not only you have textile, paintings, paperwork, uh, graphic documents are also very sensitive. And we have no idea how much light 
we receive. For instance, here it's very difficult for me to right say on. how much light I get. Yeah. Uh, because your eyes is a very good system. You know, when there are a lot of light, it's closing and uh, it adjusts it. So you don't know how, what is the quantity. You need a specific uh, equipment, tools to measure the light. And more light you have, more it's damaging. Even if you remove the ultraviolet, you know, everyone is aware that if you go on the beach on summer, the UV light, the UV can damage your skin. But even if you get rid of the UV part in the light, you might get damaged by the visible light. So the, the light I get here may, that might damage very quickly an object. So that's the reason why we have to limit it. How much light I have, it's really a, a big issue if you have a private collector, if you are at home, how much light an object receives all over the years, because the light is changing also in the room, in winter, in summer, you might have, you might have different quantity of light. So the idea was to introduce um, a simple tool to monitor how much light an object receives in a, in a house, in a room, in a gallery over one year. And we introduced this kind of light dosimeter, which is a, a, a blue piece of board, and depending on the light it receives, it turns to purple, pink, and white. And depending on the color, we know that a threshold has been passed. So if it gets pink, we know that it has received too much light if it's a sensitive object, like a color photographs or like a paper document. So if, if in less than one year, the dosimeter turn pink, it means that the room gets too much light, or the object gets too much light, and it's time to remove the object from the exhibition and to keep it in the dark until the next year. In order to not to go further, a certain limit of lighting every year. So, but, so, but, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but that means that um, uh, this photography could have a certain amount of looks per year? Yes. And when it is reached, I put it uh, in a storage, and the, the next year I take it out and have uh, the same amount. Same amount. And w yes, it's a kind of a safety margin. And with this condition, you can be sure that the object may stay in good condition for 100 years. It's very difficult to predict how an object will fade to light. It's very difficult to, to predict his behaviors. Uh, it may be very resistant, it may be very weak. But this dosimeter is like a canary bird. You know, these birds we were bringing in the mine and that pass away before the people themselves. So it, it was an indicator of the quality okay. of it. And this is exactly the same idea. You put it in the room, and if in less than one year it's turned pink or purple, so it means that too much light for a sensitive object. Not objects are sensitive, but let's say that photographs, textile, the w paper documents are the more sensitive. So, but it's, uh, so what I've learned is different. So uh, if I have color photographs from, let's say, the 50s, uh, or digital prints from 2010, they're, they're different in, uh, in fading away. Sure. Sure, it's, it's quite difficult to assess the, the light stability of, of any object. You need a specific testing. It can be done in some laboratories, but it's not affordable. It's not easy for a private collector or for gallery to, to know. So the, the principle is to be very conservative. And at least you have reference. You know how much light it has received, and you know that after this threshold, it might, be a d it might get some problems from tr in the future if you, if you leave your print your photographs in this condition, in this, in this display condition, uh, then it's very hard to predict how long it will take, how it will happen, but it's a, it's a, informa a warning system, it's an early warning system, if you want. It so, so we have on our uh, launch, we have on displays as photographs from Blumenfeld. You see how uh, the colors fading away. Uh, what would you say, as we are here on an art fair and there are a lot of people buying photography, when is the status uh, reached uh, that uh, uh, the fading is, uh, is a damage to, to the, uh, to the uh, wealth of the, the photography? Or when it's, you pay, let's say, 20,000 euros for a photography and the starting fading the colors away, and uh, when I should sell it? Well, uh, or when it's a total loss? That's a quite difficult question because uh, the problem is not the degradation itself. It's the time it needs to reach a degradation. You know, 
by the second principle of, of, uh, of thermodynamic, everything will disappear. But uh, we hope it will take a long time. So the problem is not the deterioration, it's the time between the, the <clears throat> it's spent between the, you get the image and you see the deterioration. And in the meantime, the, the awareness or the way you accept the deterioration might be different. Uh, for instance, 30 years ago, we were not accepting some deterioration. We were cleaning some photographs because they were silver mirroring and it was not acceptable. Now we accept this degradation. It's a part of the object. So the way we understand or we see a degradation is just a cultural thing. It may change over the year, it may change over the country, and it's very difficult to say at this level of degradation, you can throw away this image because even an image in very bad degradation might have some value, historical value, might have, uh, well, archaeological value or, uh, or art value. May, may, even if it's deteriorated, even if Blumenfeld picture, if it's, even if it's faded, it's maybe considered still beautiful. The fading might be have some charm for people, maybe interesting, because it says that the image comes from the past, and it doesn't mean a loss in market value. So it's quite difficult to, to say what is the degradation. I, as a physicist, as a chemist, I can say how much it has changed, but I cannot tell you how much it is deteriorated. It is um, some things that come from the society as a whole, uh, from the collector's field, from the professional field, from the curatorial field but not from the natural science part. And it's made um, conservation science quite difficult because it is at the interface between human science and uh, human social science and also uh, nat natural science, physics and chemistry. And the decisions are also very difficult to take because we need inputs from the natural science part, but also from the human science part. Yeah, so you mean uh, how we how we look at it? Uh, so it's changed in the last years, and it's maybe more common sense between collectors and uh, curators and and you, and what we accept in deteriorating. So this uh, how you call it? This uh, silver mirroring on this old black and white photographies. Maybe 20 years ago, nobody accepted this, but now it's acceptable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there are no standards, and it is changing. 20 years ago, people were trying to have the best condition print. A, a pristine condition print was required. And now we, what we observe is uh, people are very interested to have a silver mirroring because it's, uh, it's a kind of authenticity. You know, it's an old print that has been made 50 years ago or 30 years ago. It's not a recent print. So it's a part of the object. It's what we could call patina in some sense. And do, do you think the, um, that have an um, influence on the photography market? So when we are going over the art fair, you see nearly in every second gallery, you see photographies and, uh, and prints uh, from different uh, periods uh, of, the last, uh, of the last 50 years. Um, how, what would you advise to a private collector when he's buying a photography? Well, you know, I think it's... Uh it's a different field. I'm not an expert in it. It's um, collectors they buy because they, they like it much of the time, and I think it's the main reason to buy something because you yes, like it course. and you want it. So uh, except that, I cannot say more. <laughs> uh, I have no specific recommendation. Even if it, in an object in bad condition, you may like it and uh, you ma you have to buy it if you can if you can afford. That's that I think for private collectors and even for for a, a museum, a museum might have other requirement in terms of collection, but, but I think uh, appreciating the art is probably the, the first reason to buy something. Yes, of uh, course, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, what would you advise for, for museums when the museum is... Uh, there are a lot of museums, curators here, that are buying pieces for their collections. Well, I don't see a, a huge difference. Uh, for sure, if, if they have two, two prints, one in good condition and one in less good condition, I would say take the one in good condition. But, you know, it doesn't mean anything. The one in good condition might be a print from the 70s, and the one in bad condition might be a vintage. That's make a huge, a huge yeah, difference. Yeah, of course. And the, 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 the museum would prefer probably to buy a vintage, even, even if both are signed and recognized by the photographer itself. So, I mean, um, it's really a field that I'm not an expert in, you know. The, it's at, at the end of, of the scientific 
uh, expertise. I mean, that's, a, that's another connoisseurship when you deal with uh, buying art. So maybe uh, some last words, uh, how do you see the future development for, for photography, conversation, uh, conservation and uh, development new techniques? Well, um, the, the, in conservation, I learned something for the last 30 years, there are no miracles, you know. It's a slow progress, in, and it's, it's also very dependent, as I was explaining to you, of the uh, cultural condition of the society. What are the requests of the society? And the requests are changing all the time. And, you know, I don't think that uh, photography is a big issue. We still have some problem with conservation of color photographs, color storage, uh, and some, some issues are not easy to deal with. But I think the main issue is not with photography, it's with digital. Okay. <laughs> that's probably <laughs> another topic. So but uh, really, it's, uh, it, it's a challenge for the futures. We know how to preserve a material object. It may request a core storage to store below 18 degrees Celsius or below zero degree. But we can do it. It's possible. So, and then we, we can also accept some compromise, saying, well, OK, I exhibit it. I accept that this picture we lost 10% of his value within 100 years, but people will enjoy it. We know how to do that, but we don't know how to preserve digital data. We have no clue. So that's maybe a topic for the talk uh, next year. Many talks, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Many so talks. Thank, you, thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. And uh, so if you have time for some questions, I think you can write some questions to Bertrand. It's a <laughs> unique chance to have, in here, have, him, have you here in Basel. Thank you. So there are no questions? OK, then thank you very much. And uh, enjoyed it. And uh, so we're looking forward to, to receive the dosimeter in the beginning of next year so that everybody can uh, check his own collection and uh, display uh, that everything is preserved for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.